Qatar is a small country with a small population. It is one of the world's smallest sovereign states with less than 12,000 square kilometers, roughly twice the size of Delaware. And now it will be the first Middle Eastern country to host the World Cup after FIFA President Sepp Blatter announced that the 22 executive committee members had voted to award the 2022 tournament to a country with a population of only 1.7 million people, beating out rival bids from the United States, Australia, South Korea, and Japan. So, how did they get it, though? How did an absolute monarchy on the Arabian Peninsula pull off one of football's most enthralling and contentious coups? What are their plans for the 2022 World Cup? Stay tuned. Qatar is a monarchy with ultimate power. The Emir's Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani and his family has ruled Qatar since its foundation in 1850. FIFA, not surprisingly, finds absolute monarchies, oligarchies, and dictatorships simple to deal with, given its own brand of politics. Even easier than Western style democracies, where due process and discussion, at least in theory, cause decision making to take longer. In April, FIFA Secretary General Jerome Valk stated unequivocally that he prefers dealing with countries like Qatar. It's a desire that, regrettably, defines the governing body of world football. It still might be because of growth. Football as a sport would not have grown if the World Cup had been held in England, the Low Countries, or the Iberian Peninsula. With its vast expanse and population, both showed promise for FIFA's desired growth. However, according to Daily Mail, through their investigation, they speculate it might be because of corruption. Almajid, a whistleblower with whom the Mail on Sunday has previously worked closely, will be interviewed for the upcoming documentary, The Men Who Sold the World Cup. The video, which has been given broad access. Football is a global language. If you want to connect uh, people emotionally, then use that game. Will expose the criminal extent to which the Qataris went to ensure that they would host the tournament. Qatar's commitment to hosting the 2022 World Cup has been a major driving force behind its development goals and the resurrection of its building industry. The government announced a $103 billion allocation to be spent on essential infrastructure projects just in time for this major event. Athletic venues, notably the Al Baith Stadium, are on the drawing board. Al Baith, a Webbled Group project, is one of the most modern and environmentally friendly structures in terms of its technical attributes. While roughly $10 billion has been set aside for infrastructure, particularly for the World Cup, the remainder of the funding will be used to modernize infrastructure, including subways, roads, and airports. These new initiatives will help Qatar establish itself as one of the region's most advanced countries, governed by concepts of sustainability and urban regeneration. The Qatari government had anticipated that 1.5 million new employments would be created in Qatar by the 2022 World Cup, primarily in construction prior to the event and tourism and hospitality during the tournament. Qatar's investment promotion agency, IPA Qatar has also highlighted a number of areas in which the 2022 World Cup might assist and attract foreign direct investment. It states the Ministry of Commerce and Industry has recognized 83 commercial and investment opportunities for the private sector until 2023, related to preparing for and hosting the event, and that Qatar's GDP has increased at a steady 4.5% since it was granted the tournament in 2010. It's also optimistic about the future of investing opportunities. These include the development of internationally recognized sports health and medical services, the expansion of the embryonic esports sector, and a steady increase in tourism. Nasser al Qadr, the tournament CEO, has stated that once the tournament is finished, he wants the country's priority to transition from infrastructure development to tourism. He also expects the competition to bring in billions to the local economy. The boost to the construction market that the 2022 World Cup would provide will last long after the champions have returned home with their trophies. The large-scale works industry will continue to be impacted by construction sites that have opened in recent years, spurred by long-term planning for Qatar's development. According to a forecast by Mortar Intelligence, an international consultancy organization in the sector, Qatar's construction market will be valued at $76.98 billion by 2026, with an average annual growth rate of 10.54% for the period 2021-2026. to The FIFA World Cup in Qatar is shaping up to be a one-of-a-kind spectacle. According to the organizers, it provides the opportunity to watch two matches on the same day at brand new stadiums with built-in cooling technology while still having time to enjoy some culture and spend some time at the beach. The country will provide spectators with unrestricted luxury while witnessing the world's most popular sport in one of the world's wealthiest countries. From the outside, everything appears to be gorgeous as Qatar has built eight new stadiums for the competition. Despite having very little time to build such stadiums, they have ensured that they do not skimp on luxury. According to a report by the Daily Mail, all of the VIP suites in Qatari stadiums are quite lavish. 
Match Hospitality manages the lounges and divides them into five categories, Pearl Lounge, Private Suite, Business Seat, Pavilion, and Club. The Pearl Lounge, located immediately above the stadium's midway line, is the greatest of the five lounges. The lounge is only available at Lucille Stadium, where the World Cup Final will be held. Guests at Match Hospitality can enjoy a six-course meal as well as a variety of beverages and champagnes. Following that is the Private Suite, which is accessible at all eight stadiums. The Business Seat Lounges, rated four stars and described as an excellent World Cup experience, are offered at Lucille Stadium and Al Bait Stadium. Four-course menus, live cooking stations, and a variety of drinks, including champagne, spirits, and beer, as well as cocktails and mocktails, will all be available. Guests will also have easy access to prime seating and luxurious top-category seating. Organizers of the football event have tried to convince the 1.2 million guests coming from all over the world that there will be enough rooms for everyone. But, despite the uncertainties and considerable criticism of Qatar's handling of migrant labor, approximately 20 million applications for the 3 million tickets have been received. For the game, the government and FIFA have set aside 130,000 hotel and apartment rooms. On Wednesday, organizers of the Qatar World Cup showcased fan accommodations ranging from a steel bed in a studio for $84 a night to luxurious villas costing over $1,000 and luxury cruise ship suites. Visitors to the Gulf State will also need to purchase a match ticket and register for a special pass to gain entry to stadiums and fan zones before being allowed to stay in official accommodations. Qatar is also planning to dock two cruise ships in Doha port and may set up desert camps for fans. It has become the most divisive World Cup in history, with doubts raised about how the wealthy Gulf State gained the right to host it, how it has treated construction workers, and if it will be inclusive to LGBT supporters. The state has been chastised for how it treats the 30,000 migrant workers employed on the projects. Amnesty International, a human rights organization, accused Qatar of utilizing forced labor in 2016, according to the report. Many workers were living in dismal conditions, paying exorbitant recruitment costs, and having their earnings withheld and passports confiscated. Since 2017, the government has taken steps to safeguard migrant workers from working in extreme heat, limit their working hours, and improve working conditions in migrant labor camps. Human Rights Watch, however, reported in a 2021 study that foreign workers continue to face punitive and illegal salary deductions, as well as months of unpaid wages for lengthy hours of arduous work. Amnesty International claims that laborers are still being pressured, despite the abolishment of the kafala or sponsorship system, which prohibited migrant workers from leaving their positions without their employer's permission. The Guardian reported in February 2021 that 6,500 migrant laborers from India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka had perished in Qatar since the country won the bid for the World Cup. The deaths were not classified by occupation, location, or work when they were reported by authorities in the five Asian countries. However, the labor rights organization Fairsquare believes that many of those killed were likely working on World Cup infrastructure projects. Qatar's government says the figures are an overestimate because they include thousands of foreigners who died after living and working in the country for many years. Well, what do you think of Qatar holding the FIFA World Cup 2022? Do they deserve it? And have they done enough for the event? Only time will tell. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and click on some of the videos on screen. You won't be disappointed. See you there.